Well, good morning, everybody. We are continuing uh, now our second week of the pre-recorded sermons for Lifelight English Ministries at the Chinese Gospel Church. Um, thank you for joining us this morning as you visit our, our YouTube page. Um, again, we're, we're doing these pre-recorded services so that we have an opportunity uh, for more people who are part of our congregation to participate in the worship service through scripture reading and music, as well as other ways in the future, uh, people who would otherwise not be able to make it to church for our Sunday live streams. We hope that this has been an encouraging time for you uh, during a possibly discouraging season. Uh, we know that during this uh, COVID pandemic, as well as the uh, stay at home, the quarantine, uh, can really mess with our emotional well being, uh, can cause a lot of stress and anxiety. And so we do hope that uh, during this time you are able to find some sort of peace and comfort as we uh, turn to and look to God as the source of our comfort, our joy, and our peace, uh, as well as the one who we know who we can trust even during uncertain times. We know that our God is sovereign, he is powerful, and he is good. So we pray that this time would be able uh, to be a beneficial time for you, whether you are worshiping together as a family or as an individual, um, we just pray that, that Christ would be able to be magnified uh, during this time, as well as that you would be able to be encouraged. Um, we're going to continue the uh, practice of interspersing our sermon with the discussion topics to sort of break up the, uh, the, the message into shorter bits for you to have a chance to talk with your family or to text friends or, or just to consider um, these questions on your own, as well as uh, there will be a time at the end of this service for you as families or as an individual to uh, partake in communion. Again, we, we know that this is, this is not the way the church is supposed to be. Uh, we're supposed to be able to do this together, uh, but during this time, we want to take every precaution as necessary as we continue to meet together to worship. Again, the, the issue isn't whether or not we can worship together. The issue is uh, just kind of using the technology that we have available to us so that we can worship together while at the same time uh, exercising uh, caution in regards to uh, making sure that we are able to flatten the curve of the spread of, of the virus as well as uh, demonstrating love for our neighbors and so not putting ourselves or anybody else at undue risk. Uh, for announcements this morning, uh, they're kind of the same announcements that we've been covering for the past couple weeks. Uh, a big thank you goes out to those of you who have been participating in raising money for um, the purchasing and distributing of personal protective equipment to Boston area hospitals. Uh, from the slide, you can see that there's been over $30,000 raised, as well as about uh, approximately over 20,000 uh, pieces of PPE that have been going to Boston area hospitals. And so if you're interested in uh, giving to those organizations, uh, giving to the Disaster Relief Fund, um, or if you're interested in maybe donating to a, a local food bank, you can uh, check out the uh, donation instructions that are on the uh, slides uh, that are being superimposed uh, on this recording, uh, as well as ways to figure out how to continue to uh, tithe and donate to the life of the church during this time. Uh, we know it's kind of tricky that when, when you're not at church, it can kind of be an out of sight, out of mind type of thing. Uh, so we want to be able to provide you with ways that you can uh, support the life of this church, the ministries that are going on here uh, while you are uh, staying at home. And so our online banking information is available on the slide, as well as further instructions on how to give a tax-free gift to the Disaster Relief Fund, whether it's for PPE or if you want to designate it to go to, to our food bank, uh, our church will make sure that that money goes to where it needs to go. Also want to encourage us uh, to continue to take part in, to take advantage of the, um, the Friday night fellowships for English ministry. It's at 7 p.m or the youth ministry, which meets at 745 on, uh, on their Zoom chat. If you're interested in, in getting uh, an invitation to any of those groups, uh, please email me at lifelight at cgcm.org, as well as if, if you have any other questions, um, or if there's anything you would like to discuss with myself or another pastor or somebody from the church leadership, or if there is a, a hardship that your family is experiencing, or if you just would like some prayer, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we would love to be able to support you. If you could just let us know uh, 
what your needs are, we will make sure that we can lift you up uh, in whatever ways that we are able to do that. Uh, as we enter into this time of worship, um, one of our worship teams will be leading the worship service this morning uh, with some songs. Uh, but before we do that, I will read our call to worship, which comes from the book of Psalm 145, verses 13 through 21. And then I will pray, and then we will uh, sing together. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all of his promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord abhor, upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and he saves them. The Lord watches all over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. So my mouth will sing in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Let me pray and then we'll enter into worship together through singing. Lord, we want to remind ourselves of how you are good. Uh, regardless of how we may be feeling, regardless of how uh, we may be struggling in this current time, we uh, ask that you would give us grace and strength to trust your goodness, to know your goodness, to love your goodness. Uh, we thank you that you are a good God who cares for us, not according to our own righteousness, not according to our own ability to exercise strong enough faith or to walk in complete obedience to you, uh, but even as we fail, even as we doubt, even as uh, our faith may be shaken, you are good to us. And so we pray this morning that as we sing of your love, sing of your provision for us in our daily needs, and how you provided everything we need for life and godliness through faith in Christ, we pray that you would receive all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Amen.
Hebrews 4:14 4, through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, 
yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If I were to ask you, what do you think the strongest animal on the planet is? Would you think it was something like a gorilla or a lion or a bear or an elephant? You know, something that when you see its size and how much space it takes up, you think to yourself, well, obviously this is the strongest animal in the world. Well, what if I were to rephrase the question by saying, what is the strongest animal on this planet relative to its own size? Well, when you phrase it that way, it's no longer the elephant or the gorilla or the lion. It's actually a beetle, uh, specifically a dung beetle. It's a great name. This beetle is, is so, so strong that despite its size, it's able to pull 1,141 times its own body weight. I mean, that's incredible. Over 1,000 times its own body weight. If you were to uh, do a comparison, that would be like an average human male being able to pull a uh, six double-decker buses that are full of passengers. That's incredible. Uh, we can't even think about uh, what it would look like for a human to be able to do that. That was really interesting. I, I, thought, I thought that was really interesting. Maybe you do too. Uh, but you're probably asking the question, why did I ask that? Uh, what was the point of, of that question, a question about a, a dung beetle? I mean, as impressive as that is, um, we don't think about dung beetles that much because of, of their size, uh, as well as the fact that they're not really part of our everyday life. And so kind of out of sight, out of mind. And when we take those things for granted, we don't realize the incredible power that that animal has. Because it's not part of our daily existence, we don't appreciate the strength of that animal, of that beetle. And in some cases, as, as weird as it is to draw a parallel between a beetle and the Bible, our scripture passage for this morning is sort of like that as well. It's a, it's a small section of scripture, and it includes a lot of references about uh, something that is not part of our normal daily existence, uh, so we don't often think about it. Uh, but nonetheless, this small passage of scripture, uh, with maybe an obscure reference to something that's not part of our daily existence, includes some amazingly powerful truths about who Jesus is and, and what he has done for us. Not only what he has done for us, but how our lives can be different as a result afterwards. You know, all throughout the passage of, of the book of Hebrews, through passages throughout the book of Hebrews, there's this idea that we are to hold fast to our confession about who Jesus is and to not fall away. And this passage this morning helps us again realize who is Jesus and how does he help us in our relationship with God? And this passage is so dense that we could spend weeks studying it and still feel like we were driving by it on the highway at 70 miles an hour. Uh, but, but the good news is that even though we can't spend as much time this morning uh, learning as much as we would like to about um, this idea of who Jesus is within the context of the main theme. Uh, the good news is that this chapter, um, this passage actually acts as a springboard for six more chapters that go into far greater detail about this theme that again gets introduced to us. The theme of Jesus being our great high priest. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, it may seem hard for us to sort of see the relevance for that in our life, uh, just in the sense of we, we're, we're, not, we're not really around beetles that often, so we can't appreciate their strength. Uh, we're not around priests that much, and so the imagery may be lost on us at first. Um, you know, in America, we are uh, growing increasingly secular, uh, increasingly post-Christian, and so people's experiences with priests is becoming less and less. 
we think about Catholic priests or Orthodox priests or maybe some more liturgical aspects of, of Protestant Christianity, uh, people's experiences with priests is becoming less and less familiar. But, you know, even though we don't have this sort of a religious familiarity with priests that we used to, I still think that we are really familiar with the idea of what a priest does, and we still want to have a priest. When you think about it this way, we're all s still eagerly looking around for somebody to uh, sort of look at us uh, and be able to, pr to pronounce that, that we are okay, that we are, if we want to use religious language, we, have, we are clean. We have done what we have been supposed to do, and, and, and we are okay. We measure up. And we see this a lot in society around us today uh, when we think about the role that uh, Twitter and other social media platforms have uh, been using uh, sort of this, this uh, cancel culture that when certain groups of people find somebody's tweets from a certain number of years ago or even more recently uh, with where what they said didn't match with what they think um, should be said in regards to maybe something like politics or race relations or, or gender relations. If somebody says something offensive or holds a view that goes against the, the popular view of culture, there is this desire for them to be canceled, for them to be called out, for them to act as authoritative figures to say, you don't measure up, you're not good enough, you're not clean. And so, uh, as I said before, we, we may be moving away from the religious sense of what a priest does, but nonetheless, we still have this desire for somebody to be able to look at us and say, you are clean, you are enough, you measure up. That's what a priest does. And Hebrew spends a lot of time on this idea of Jesus being our great high priest. The way that Jesus is called a great high priest, it's actually kind of uh, doing some wordplay with the, the Greek and Hebrew uh, phrases. Jesus is actually, uh, if you were to translate it literally, he's the high, high priest. He uses that phrase high twice to show that he is the best version of the high priest. And we need to understand that the Bible spends so much time talking about Jesus as our high priest because in the Bible, the priest was seen as God's sort of chief uh, instrument or the chief central figure about how God would interact with us to restore our broken relationship, to forgive our sin, as well as uh, to be able to, to purify us from the effects of sin and, and, and what it does in our, our daily life and, and what it does in society. You see, the priest was the mediator between God and man. The priest would act as a mediator. He would stand in front of God on behalf of humanity with an offering or a sacrifice as a way to um, show uh, sorrow over sin as well as a desire for uh, a relationship to be made right. Uh, oftentimes through the blood of a substitute, they would offer this sacrifice. And then the mediator then would also act, uh, the priest would act as the mediator between God and man. So he would receive this sacrifice and offer it to God and then turn around and say, because of this sacrifice, you, person, have been made clean. The priest is not the one who's making somebody clean. The priest is not the one who's pronouncing that they are forgiven, but rather it is God who's pronouncing these things. And the priest then communicates what God has done to that person. So again, the priest is the mediator, the one who acts for man, on behalf of man to God, as well as on behalf of God to man. So again, I'm, I'm taking some time to sort of reinforce an idea that may be foreign to us. I think a lot of times what happens is that nowadays that when we are um, not confronted, but when, when a, a concept or a topic or a theme comes up that we don't necessarily know what it means, uh, we're tempted to just sort of skip over it and to not appreciate it. Uh, but in, in reality, that when we take the time to understand who a priest was and what they did, it helps us so much more understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us. I mean, I just think about um, my 
past couple of years in working in full-time youth ministry about how many times I had to stop and ask a student, what does it mean when you say that? Um, this, this phrase that you use, what does it mean for you to call somebody a visco girl? When, or when somebody asked me who my bias is, I was like, what do you mean by that? Well, it turns out that when somebody asks you who your bias is, that means uh, usually in the, in the context of, of K-pop, Korean pop music, who's your favorite member? Or when somebody explained to me what a visco girl was, it, it helps me understand, oh, so when you use that phrase, that's what that means. It really helped me relate to students more as, as well as a, an opportunity for me to laugh at myself and realize how uh, painfully out of touch I can be as, as I get older. Uh, and in the same way, when, when we pause and we reflect on what a priest did and who they were, it helps us understand in a new and deeper way who Jesus is and why it's so important for us to hold fast to our confession of who he is. So Jesus is our great high priest. There are several reasons why in this passage, Hebrews 4 tells us that Jesus is our great high priest. And the first one that we're going to cover today is that Jesus is our great high priest because he passed through the heavens. Now this phrase, passing through the heavens, is going to get explained more and more in Hebrews chapter 9. So all I'm going to do right now is kind of give us a bird's eye view about what that means, that Jesus passed through the heavens. Hebrews, if we want to think about it in terms of a... Uh, a musical piece, the melody of Hebrews, the reoccurring theme that happens to help us to know what it's about is this idea of what was done in the past, Jesus is now the fulfillment of it. And so when it says that Jesus passed through the heavens, we're supposed to go back into our minds and our memories and our understanding of what happened in the Old Testament to, to remember the time when the high priest on the Day of Atonement would bring in the blood of a sacrifice to offer forgiveness for the people of Israel. Now again, on this, this Day of Atonement, it was, it was one day a year where one specific priest, the high priest and nobody else, would go into a specific room called the Holy of Holies. If we want to think about it, if you don't really know what that is, the Holy of Holies was a, a special room in either the tabernacle or the temple when it was built that acted as like the centralized hotspot of God's presence and God's holiness in the world. It was a separate room in the temple. It was cut off from the rest of the temple through a really, really big, thick curtain. And in there, there was just a couple articles. One of them was the Ark of the Covenant. And it was on the Day of the Atonement that the priest would come in with the blood of a sacrifice, of a substitute, and put that blood on the Ark of the Covenant as a way of saying that the relationship between God and man has been fixed. That the blood of the substitute takes the penalty of the nation of Israel. And there is also some other uh, meaning behind that as well, that not only did it um, fix the broken relationship because the, the substitute took the punishment of our sin, but it also had a way of showing that the blood of the animal actually purified the temple as well. The blood of the substitute had a way of purifying the effects of sin on the world. And again, that would only happen one day a year in one particular room, with one particular priest. But it happened every year on the same day because all that could really do is provide temporary forgiveness or temporary cleansing from sin. And when the priest would offer the sacrifice, he would, he would do it and he would get out. He wouldn't pause, he wouldn't sit down, he wouldn't kick his feet up. You know, nowadays he, he wouldn't send some sort of geotag on Snapchat or, or an Instagram story showing where he was. He went in, he offered the sacrifice, and he got out. Because it showed the reality that in the presence of God, with the consequence of our sin, it's a very scary place to be because of God's holiness. Our sin causes death. And that's why it required the blood 
of a substitute. And so the priest would go in, he would offer the blood of the substitute on the Ark of the Covenant or the atonement cover, as it's called, and then he would get out. But what Jesus does is different, is that he doesn't go into some sort of physical temple or physical tabernacle, but it says that he actually goes into the actual presence of God. He entered into the heavens with his own blood. Not the blood of a substitute, but with the blood of himself. And then as we go back into Hebrews chapter 1, we think about how Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God because his sacrifice was enough to cover our sin once and for all. There was no more need for reoccurring sacrifices. There was no more need for a priest to go into the Holy of Holies year after year after year because Jesus is the fulfillment of that. There's no more need for reoccurring sacrifices because the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus is enough to cover our sin and purify us in God's sight forever. So Jesus is our great high priest because he entered into the very presence of God with his own blood as a way of offering us forgiveness. We're going to take a quick discussion break. I'm going to put up a couple of questions for you to think about. So if you're watching this together with family, um, you, guys, you guys can discuss it as a family. Or if, if you're watching this on your own as an individual, um, if you want to text somebody, maybe a friend from church, uh, this would be a good time for just take a couple minutes and uh, think about some uh, application of this uh, concept of priests in our life. Well, welcome back. Um, I hope that you guys were able to have some, some good conversation or maybe even some uh, good personal reflection about uh, this idea of, of what it means, first of all, that we're so easily drawn into this temptation to look for somebody to, uh, to be able to, to look at us and say, you are clean, you are accepted, you've done what you're supposed to do, um, about how we're all looking for that in some capacity, but then also realizing how Jesus is the only one who is able to do that um, for us through his blood in, in a way that truly makes us acceptable uh, before God. So Jesus is our great high priest because he entered into the heavens, the presence of God with his own blood. Uh, secondly, Jesus is our great high priest and apologies to, to grammar teachers here because this actually includes a, a double negative. It says that, uh, Essentially, Jesus is our great high priest, or rather, 
we have a great high priest, we do not have a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Again, it's, it's a double negative. We do not have someone who is not able to. So we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. So if we want to put it in the grammatically uh, correct way or a positive way, Jesus is our great high priest because he is sympathetic to us. He knows what it is like to be us. It says, uh, Jesus was tempted like us in every way, but was without sin. We're actually going to break that up into two different parts. Um, so the high priest had to be a representative to the nation of Israel. Not only did he have to be a representative, but he, he had to actually be from the nation of Israel. He had to be from a specific tribe. Uh, the reason why is because he had to identify with the people that he represented. Uh, he had to live where they lived. He had, to, he had to walk where they walked. He had to experience life as they experienced uh, because he was their representative. Uh, as, as we know that with, with the upcoming presidential elections, um, there is a sense of where we're all looking for a, a leader who knows what it's like to be us. Whatever the qualities there may be about upcoming presidential candidates, there, there is a sense of where nobody says, I want a leader who has no idea what it's like to be me. It's kind of ridiculous. We want somebody who knows what it's like in some capacity to be us so that they can best represent our interests as well as consider us when they are working and, and when they're leading. And this is where it starts to get just truly mind blowing about the, the claims of the Christian faith, the confession that we hold on to, that Jesus, who is both fully God, is also fully man. I know in the West, a lot of times we try and, and understand everything. We're uncomfortable with the idea of mysteries or things that sort of defy our understanding. And so we always try and explain it. But in reality, is the, the, the Trinity in some, in some way is a mystery that we will never truly understand. And part of that is, is this idea of, of what it means for, for Jesus to be both fully God as well as fully man. And it says that while he was fully man and fully God, he experienced temptations like we do. I mean, we think about when Jesus was led into the wilderness after his baptism, and he was tempted by the devil. Uh, it says that he was fasting for 40 days, and, and the devil came to him and, and said, Jesus, use your power. You, you know who you are. I know who you are. Um, prove to these people who you are. Turn these stones into bread so that you can eat. And when he's doing that, he's not just tempting Jesus to satisfy his hunger. He's actually tempting Jesus to not trust God during his time of need. The devil is trying to get Jesus to take matters into his own hands rather than trusting on God to provide for him in his weakness. So Jesus was tempted like us, it says, in, in every respect. Jesus knows what it's like to experience temptation, but he never sinned. It says in verse 15, he never sinned. Now, I, I know that when I say that, your immediate reaction is to, to probably say something like, well, of course, Jesus never sinned. He was God. How hard could it have been for Jesus to resist temptation when he is fully God? I mean, we think about, this is it's just an illustration, and, and I hope you understand the illustration, um, but if we think about um, if, if somebody like Tom Brady, um, I know for some of you it's too soon for me to use that as an illustration, but if Tom Brady in, in his new location down in Florida uh, somehow manages to join a youth football league, you know, we think about like a sixth grade football league, and he wins MVP, most valuable player of that youth football league, nobody would be surprised by that. Of course he did. He's Tom Brady. He's one of the best quarterbacks in the history of the game. So of course he would be the best. I think a lot of times we, we think about the temptations of Jesus in that respect as well. It wasn't that hard for Jesus. He was fully God. 
he doesn't really know what it's like to be tempted. But before we start to think that way, let's remember that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, before his crucifixion, he was praying to God for some other way to have it. He was praying for some, if we want to, some, if we want to put it this way, some way to get out of it. It says that Jesus was so stressed over the reality of, of the, the fear that he was feeling over uh, the physical pain that he was about to experience, as well as knowing that he was going to be uh, abandoned by God on the cross, that it said that he was sweating blood. He was resisting temptation at that point to give up, or he was resisting temptation to sort of say, I'm not going to do it. So Jesus resisted temptation. And then even later on in the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, uh, the author is, is telling the people who are experiencing some sort of persecution for their faith, he says, remember the temptations and the sufferings of Jesus. You haven't experienced things to the degree that you have because none of you are experiencing temptation to the point of shedding blood. And so Jesus experienced temptation in the realist sense of what it means. And so we have to do a little bit of a theological digging or theological deep dive about what it means for Jesus to experience temptation as both God and as both man. Because remember, the confession that we are told to hold on to is that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Theologians uh, have written a lot and spent a lot of time uh, helping people in the church understand about how the nature of God, as well as the nature of man, can both fully exist in the person of Jesus at all times. And so in Jesus, we have the nature of man as well as the nature of God in one person. And it's hard for us to understand exactly what that means. Uh, but just think about it this way. This, this illustration uh, that I thought about um, kind of helps us understand the, the, uh, the way it, it wasn't with the dual nature of Jesus and how Jesus experienced temptation as a human. Uh, this is kind of like an opposite illustration. If you've ever gone golfing, or if you're familiar enough with, with what golfing is, you know that people carry around different clubs uh, because there are times when one club won't work for a particular need. Uh, when you're on the tee box and you're about to drive off of the tee, you don't use your putter. You use your driver. If you are stuck in a sand, uh, sand trap, you use a, a particular club for that particular occasion, a sand wedge. Uh, and when you're, on, when you're on the green and you're putting, you use your putter. You, you don't use your driver. And when you're, when you're not using those other clubs, you put them in their bag, you put them in the bag, because you're not using, they're, they're sort of seen as irrelevant or almost a, a hindrance for what you're trying to do. And I think that what we are tempted to think of uh, when we think about the temptation of Jesus is, is just the same. That Jesus, when he was being tempted, he put his, his human nature in the proverbial golf bag and only relied on his divine nature. He realized, boy, this is too tough. If I rely on my human nature, I may, fit, I may fail. And so uh, you know, let's put that human nature aside. And he only resisted temptation as God. And if that were the case, if, if Jesus only resisted temptation as God and not as man, then, then what hope is that for us? We need to realize that when Jesus experienced temptation, he did so with the fullness, of, the full understanding that, that he was experiencing it as a human, that when Jesus resisted temptation, he did so as a human, not as simply the divine nature that put his humanity aside for the moment, but rather in the fullness of his human nature, Jesus resisted temptation. Jesus resisted temptation as a human. And so Jesus knows exactly what the power of temptation is like because he has experienced. He is, uh, he is a realist when it comes to temptation. He knows. Uh, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis that says, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. 
A silly idea is current that good people don't know what temptation means. That's an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong temptation is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army when you fight against it, not when you give in. You find out the strength of a wind when you try to walk against it, not when you lie down. A man who gives into temptation after five minutes simply doesn't know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They've lived a sheltered life, always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil imp impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. Jesus is really the only complete realist. So what is the result of Jesus and his obedience? Well, there's a couple of things that uh, result from that. Number one is, is, in some cases, it's almost counterintuitive when you think about it. Because Jesus resisted, it actually strengthens his ability to sympathize with us. It's, it's part of his understanding about what it means for us to be a human. And I think sometimes we, we need to be encouraged by that because a lot of times when we uh, think about our own failures, we must think that Jesus is really tired of us, right? Or we just kind of imagine we're walking down the road and Jesus is 50 feet ahead of us and he's waiting for us. Uh, he's got his arms crossed wondering when we're ever going to catch up. And maybe we think Jesus gets annoyed with us because we're slowing him down. But because Jesus has experienced and knows what it's like to be us, he is sympathetic with us. Jesus is sympathetic with us. He doesn't lose his patience with us like we're often to do with each other when we're really good at something and somebody else is having a hard time figuring it out. It's really easy for us to get impatient and just say, here, let me do it. Or why can't you figure this out like I can? Jesus is sympathetic and he is patient with us. Early in the book of Hebrews, it says that he is not ashamed to call us his brothers. He is not ashamed to call us his sister. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And Jesus also knows what it's like to be a human. In some cases, it's, it's, it's best to understand that Jesus is the true example of what it means to be a human in the way that he fully obeyed God. Jesus demonstrates what it's like to live up to our created potential and our created purpose. We think about that phrase from uh, William Shakespeare, it says, to err is human. Well, that's not true. If Jesus was fully human and he never sinned, then sinning is not inherent to what it means to be a human. It, it challenges us in our understanding of what it means to be a human. And third and most important that when the fact that Jesus died on the cross without ever sinning, when Jesus took our punishment, it means that because Jesus never sinned, he truly was our substitute because he only carried the weight of our sin, not his own. He only paid for the punishment of our sin, not his own. We think about what's going on in the world and, and how hand sanitizer is, is such hot demand and how it, cure, it kills 99.9% .9 or whatever the, uh, the ratio is of, of bacteria or, or germs. There's always that little bit left that it can't kill for. And so sometimes we think maybe that's what Jesus was doing on the cross is that maybe he wasn't really paying for all of my sin. But because Jesus was sinless, the only sin he was paying for on the cross was our own, not his own. Unlike the high priest in the Old Testament who had to offer a sacrifice for himself, Jesus only pays for our sin, for my sin, for your sin. And the Bible says, for the sins 
of the world. In 2 Corinthians, it says that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. We're going to take another pause to uh, engage in some more discussion, whether it's with the people that are sitting next to us or maybe the people we're keeping in contact with over our phones or some sort of chat feature, or even just in the quietness of our own hearts. Um, take some time to think about, do we really believe that Jesus is sympathetic to us? Or do we doubt his patience? As well as, what does Jesus and his sinless life mean for us and how he is our substitute. Well, welcome back. And as we enter into this uh, final section of the message for this morning, we want to look at the, the third outcome or the third result um, of what it means that Jesus is our great high priest. Verse 16, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this is just such an amazing uh, thought for us to, to consider as, as we compare it to uh, what was done in the past with the, the high priest and the Day of Atonement and entering into the Holy of Holies, is that we now no longer need some sort of extra mediator to go to God on our behalf because Jesus is already there. He is seated at the right hand of God, the scriptures say, interceding for us. On our behalf, Jesus, therefore, has, has gone before us and, and he left the door open. He, he pulled the curtain back so that we could follow him in to the presence of God. We are able to approach God's throne of grace with confidence because we know that Jesus and his blood have made a way for us to be acceptable for God, before God for all time. We don't need any extra priests. In fact, in the book of 1 Peter, it talks about how Christians are a kingdom of priests. We are the ones who are able to go into God's presence with confidence, uh, boldness, as it says in other passages, because Jesus has paid our way in. He has given us access to the throne room of grace through his blood. And why does he do that? so that we can hold fast to him. 
As we said in other passages in the book of Hebrews, there are some very serious warnings about falling away from Jesus. And if we know that if we are not to fall away, if we are to hold fast to our confession of faith in Christ, we need God's help. We can't do it on our own. But because we are in need of God's help, we are actually able to go to God in prayer personally in our time of need. When we think about prayer, and I'll be, one of the fir- I'll be the first to admit that, that prayer is hard for me, whether it's because of feeling uh, unqualified or just distracted or not really, sure, not really sure what to pray for. I think sometimes we, we view prayer um, incorrectly. We, we see it as maybe this idea of like a wealthy person um, who is sitting in their home, maybe even during this quarantine time, where it's not really, they're not really suffering that much. And they call their butler, they call uh, DoorDash, and, and they receive whatever it is that they feel like they want at that particular moment. And, and sometimes we, we view prayer that way, where we see God as simply as, as responding to our whims and responding to what we may feel like at a particular moment. But I don't think that's necessarily what prayer is, uh, at least in regards to this passage. Uh, Rather than seeing it as a wealthy person living in the lap of luxury, uh, we see prayer as uh, an illustration of soldiers fighting on the front lines, uh, desperately calling in reinforcements on the radio, uh, knowing that unless their, their supply line comes through or reinforcements show up, uh, they know that the enemy is going to overrun them. They know that the battle will be lost unless they are able to receive the support that they need to continue fighting. And I think that in the context of Hebrews, as well as just the reality of the Christian life, that is a a much more appropriate way to see the role of prayer in our life as a way for us to rely on God's power so that we could remain faithful to him. And if we're to be honest, this this idea of praying to God or or coming to God with with confidence, we know that for a lot of us, for either the part of our life that we're in right now or for parts of our life, um, confidence is is the adjective or the word that we would use the least or or confidence is, is the opposite of how we feel when we approach God's throne. Uh, We feel incredibly unconfident or insecure when we approach God. Maybe we think about passages in the Bible where there's that story between uh, the the two brothers that were, um, they were alienated from each other because of how one brother's behavior um, had offended another brother. And there was a time of reconciliation where the two were coming together and one of the brothers um, put forth all of his possessions all of his animals, all of his livestock, all of his possessions, sort of leading the way so that this other brother, the one who was offended, would see all of these gifts or see all of these these goodwill intentions and say, oh, this person must really mean that they are, that they really are repentant, that they, they really are sorry. Or we think about how Jesus told the story of the, the parable of the prodigal son and how the, the son, when he realized the ways that he had squandered his, his father's um, wealth, was, was coming back to his father in shame and, and sorrow and regret. And he was uh, rehearsing over and over again his, his apologies just uh, so that the father would know that he really was serious. Or maybe for some of us, um, we just feel so defeated or discouraged or ashamed based off of our own life that we feel like we can't even go to God's throne. That the, fr- the, the fact that it's called a throne of grace just kind of sounds like, it yeah, may be a throne of grace for you, but, but not for me, not considering everything that I've done. But just as a simple closing and as a way for us to uh, tie in to communion, we're reminded of the beautiful gospel promises that because Jesus, our great high priest, entered into heaven with his own blood 
as the final sacrifice for our sin, our great high priest who knows what it is like to be us, our great high priest who was our substitute, who paid for our sin, invites us into God's presence where he already is so that we might be able to receive mercy and to find grace in our time of need. He invites us to come to him, not with all of our past performances, not with all the reasons why we're good enough, or not with all the excuses with why we can't come, but rather Jesus invites us into God's presence, empty-handed, because he has already paid for our admission. So we are able to enter into God's throne room of grace with confidence so that we might be able to receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. And we're actually going to now uh, take part in communion that even though we may be separated from each other uh, spatially because of concerns over uh, coronavirus, we know that we are united to each other through faith. And as we take these elements, representations of how the broken body of Jesus was broken for us, as well as his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins, are also the ways that we are healed, the ways that we are purified, and the ways that we are now encouraged, admonished, and even commanded to enter into God's presence with confidence so that we might be able to find help in our time of need. Well, as we, as, as we have mentioned in the past, that uh, taking communion virtually is uh, far from the ideal. Um, we know that in communion, the picture represents how many are made one through the blood of Jesus. And so we know that this is uh, far from ideal, and Lord willing, this will be a, a temporary solution uh, until the time we are able to meet together again safely in a way that um, is just the, the most res uh, respective of everybody's uh, well-being. Um, and so until that day, we, we continue to hope and pray. And remember that communion isn't simply something that we do uh, in an end of itself, but it is a gift that God has given his church as a way of, of showing that those who have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, um, how their sins have been forgiven, how they have been bought with a great price, and that Jesus is the one who is our hope. He is our confidence. He is our assurance uh, that we are able to enter into God's presence. And as the, the practice at, at CGCM, uh, the communion is open to all of those who have uh, confessed faith in Christ as their Savior, as well as uh, have taken that step in obedience of baptism. For I received from the Lord what I also now pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, as we close our service this morning, again, uh, thank you so much to those of you who have tuned in and uh, have been following us on, on YouTube as well as participating in our Sunday school and Friday night activities. Uh, we do hope uh, that you're able to continue to enjoy us, uh, excuse me, uh, continue to join us as we um, figure out ways to, to, to meet together during this time. 
Uh, as a way of reminder, if you are interested in joining any of those fellowships uh, that were mentioned before, uh, but would like to receive an email invitation, uh, please make sure to reach out to me, uh, lifelight at CGCM. And as a way of having God's word have the final say in our service this morning, I encourage you to hear the words of uh, Hebrews chapter 13. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. May he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.